looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." Then he said to them, Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. This is the word of the Lord. Do you guys remember this song? Rudolf, if I can have the slide up. Yeah? Anybody? From the 90s. Whoop, there it is, from Tag Team. Used in so many films we grew up with. Classic go-to party song. Hmm? DC's in the house, jump, jump, rejoice. There's a party over here, a party over there. Weave your hands in the air, shake the... Oh, I can't say that, I can't say that, sorry. These three words mean you're getting busy. Whoop, there it is. And then everyone goes, whoop, there it is. And everyone in the music video has got stank face on. Whoop, there it is. And I'm pointing, guys remember it? Catchy song. Why? Well, because it draws your attention to there, and it draws your attention to it. Listen to it. Whoop, there it is. Where? And what? Do you guys see it? So our teaching text today brought this song to mind because Jesus drops it. Whoop, there it is. First, he says, who do you say that I am? Ripper of a question. And then Jesus says, I must die. And then he says, you must die. Whoop, there it is. He just drops it. This is a massive turning point in the book of Mark. If you're new with us this morning, we're teaching through the book of Mark. And it confronts us with a really serious question that we have to respond to. And it gives us two very important teachings of Jesus. Why do I say it's a turning point? Well, after the glory and success of the first eight chapters, the disciples believed that they were going to win. Obviously, I mean, Jesus has been doing incredibly well in the first eight chapters of Mark. And the disciples go, well, if we keep on following him, we are definitely going to win. But one way in which we're not going to win is by losing. And then Jesus drops these three bombs on them. And it is enough for Peter to literally shout at him. That is what rebuke means in verse 32. Trigger warning. I am going to shout now. Peter didn't take Jesus to the side and went, Hey, listen, Jesus. I just want to chat to you about what you just said because I kind of disagree with you and I would like to understand more. No, 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 fam. Peter spoke to Jesus like Jesus spoke to demons. No! Be quiet! Silence! Go away! That's how Peter speaks to Jesus after Jesus drops this. Why such a strong reaction? Have you ever thought about that? Why was and is this teaching of Jesus so hard to hear and so hard to submit under? Let me ask it this way. Can you answer the question, who do you say that I am? Can you? If Jesus confronted you with that this morning. Do you know and understand and believe why Jesus had to die? Because that's the second thing he says. And are you willing to die as a response to his question and his death? Do you feel with him? It's weighty stuff now, isn't it? This is life and death stuff. 
And how it works in terms of Jesus and us is he drops and we deal. There it is. He's Lord, he's King, he's God, and we're not. So if he says hard things, then it's up to us to deal with it. So, let's deal with it. You guys ready? Let's back up a little bit. Let's look at uh, Mark 1 to 8, a summary from the Bible project. You guys will remember that the big question in Mark 1 to 8 is, who is Jesus? And all eight chapters describe what I would call the glory days. It's very clear that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark told us so in the very first verse. And through everything happening in chapters 1 to 8, it is clear that Mark was right. Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Now, Mark turns his attention to answering the question, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? So let me show you a second slide. So from the second part of chapter 8 all the way through to chapter 10, that's the big question. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? Now, look at all the question marks. Question marks in conversation number one. Question marks in conversation number two. And question marks in conversation number three. So multiple conversations to try and explain exactly what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. But it's hard for people to hear. And it's hard for people to understand. And it's hard for people to know what the appropriate response is to him in this section. I mean, in this very conversation, after Jesus asks the question, and the right answer is actually given, hashtag, well done Peter, Jesus shares what that means according to him. And it's the opposite of what his followers thought it meant. And that's why Peter reacted in this strong way. I mean, let's just put ourselves in Peter's shoe, shoes for a minute. Peter wants to win, fam. Everyone wants to. So Peter is in the position where he says, listen, Jesus, I want to win. And we want to win. And you definitely also want to win because you are the Messiah. The only way that we'll win is if we take the game to them, if I can use a sporting metaphor. If we keep on pounding away at the opposition, if we dominate them, if we give them something of their own medicine, we fight Jesus, we definitely won't win by losing. And then Jesus says, as a matter of fact, you will. We will. There it is. Do you guys see the reaction? Do you see where the question marks come from? Because that does sound weird now, doesn't it? We are going to win by losing. It was a struggle for the disciples. It's a struggle for us too. So let's pray and then struggle through this portion of Scripture together. Lord Jesus, we want to be obedient to you. You are Lord. You are King. You are the Messiah. You are alive. You are our Savior. You are the one who sent us the Spirit. You are the one who is the head of the church. You are the one who is seeking and saving the lost. You are the one who decided to make us part of your mission. Lord Jesus, have your way in us. We identify with Peter, Lord Jesus. We really don't want to lose, but we realize today that if we don't lose, we won't win. And if we want to try and save, we'll lose. And if we want to save, we should lose, because through the losing, we'll save. It's a tough one for us, Lord Jesus, but I trust that your spirit is, uh, is in us, around us, and um, very present to illuminate our hearts, to bring conviction of sin, and also to confirm the truth of the word to us this morning. So as we jump into it now, I pray that you would have your way through me and through all of us in this place. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so... I said the theme is, there it is. So here's the leading question. Where is what? You guys see what I did there? Three easy points. The question, the first death, and the second death. That's what Jesus drops. The question, the first death, and the second death. Let's look at the question. I've got some highlights up here for you. All of this happens in Caesarea Philippi. That matters. 
you'll see that Jesus asks, and he asks a general question first, people. Then he asks again, but then he points the finger. Who do you say that I am? The word Messiah in there is very important. And then there's a little nugget in there in verse 30 where Jesus strictly warned them not to talk about it, which we will get to now. Let's talk about Caesarea Philippi first. I got a map for you guys, and I think it's quite a cool map. It is a 3D map. Hey, 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 all the Bible nerds in the house. Yep. Okay, so Sea of Galilee, 10 kilometers in diameter. You'll see up there it says there's the Jesus Triangle, where Jesus spent most of his time. So between Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin is where Jesus spent most of his time. Over here is Tiberias which is a massive city. It was a massive city back in the day as well. There's Magdala. That's where Maria Magdalena came from. Sorry, Mary Magdalene. Yeah, Mar- oh, sorry, my bad. Woo! I'm getting mixed up in languages here. And then when Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. This is, of course, the other side. And you guys remember, I mentioned the name, the Golan Heights. So the Golan Heights sit here. And then Syria is all the way up there, northeast. Can you guys see Caesarea Philippi? Can you see Mount Hermon? Okay, so Mount Hermon, Caesarea Philippi, the river runs down to the Sea of Galilee, and here is Capernaum. Okay, it's about 40 kilometers by foot from Capernaum to Caesarea Philippi. Let me show you a picture of Caesarea Philippi. This is ruins of the ancient city, Caesarea Philippi. Do you guys know what ruins is? It's when a city is destroyed and then they dig it up and then they go, oh my word, look at all this. So these are ancient ruins. Staircases, shrines, caves, the foundations of houses that possibly stood there, or uh, uh, official government buildings or what have you. So those are the ancient ruins of Caesarea, <coughs> sorry, of Caesarea Philippi. And then, do you guys know what that massive hole is? It's called the Gates of Hell. There you go. The Gates of Hades. So that matters a lot. Let me tell you why. Look at the parallel passage in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, so have this picture in your head. Sorry, Rudolf, just one back quickly. Have this picture in your head. Jesus and his disciples right there in Caesarea Philippi, bustling with people at the gates of hell. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, sure, the son of the living God. We didn't have that in the gospel of Mark. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church on this confession that I am the Messiah and the gates of Hades will not overpower it and the gates of Hades will not overpower it let's go back to the peak so Jesus stood there showed his hand there and went that will not overpower my church A church that is built on the confession that I am the Messiah, that I am the King, that I call the shots, that church will not be overpowered by what comes from that black hole. It's powerful stuff now, isn't it? Okay, cool, 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 cool. So what is that? And why does the gates of hell actually matter? Permit me the opportunity to read a piece of history to you as written by Ray Vandalin, because I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to botch this one. He says, Caesarea Philippi was a city dominated by immoral activities and pagan worship. In Old Testament times, the northeastern area of Israel became a center for Baal worship, or Baal if you want to. In the nearby city of Dan, that's the most northern city in Israel, Israelite king Jerobeam, who was one of Solomon's sons, built the high place that angered God and eventually led the Israelites to worship false gods. And eventually, worship of the Baal gods was replaced with worship of Greek fertility gods. Okay, so immoral activity, pagan worship, lots of worship of fertility gods. 
Now, Caesarea Philippi became the religious center for worship of the Greek god Pan. The Greeks named the city Panias in his honor. Pan was the Greek god who was also called God of the Wild. He was often affiliated with sex, which connected him to fertility and the season of spring. Because the season of spring is when we see new life in the wild. Do you guys see the connection they made? Now, Pan was often depicted with a massive erection. Massive. That's why I couldn't show you guys a pic. It's nauseating. It's, it's devastating. And the reason why Pan had such a colossal erection is because Pan penetrated whoever and whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted to. That was his way. Do you guys hear that I said whatever? Not only whoever. So Pan had the hindquarters of a goat, so he was often depicted having sex with goats. That's Pan for you. Now when Romans conquered the territory, Herod Philip rebuilt the city and then he named it after himself. Right? So from the Caesar, Caesarea, Philip, Philippi. That's where the name comes from. And then Caesarea Philippi, even after he rebuilt it, continued their focus on the worship of Greek gods. So in the cliff that stood above the city, local people built shrines and temples to Pan. Can you guys see the shrines and the temples to Pan? Look at all those little holes in the cliff right above the city. Now, they believed the cave at Caesarea Philippi, that big black hole, created a gate to the underworld. And that's where they believed the fertility gods lived during the winter. So they believed that their city was literally at the gates of the underworld, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell. And Caesarea Philippi's location was especially unique because it stood at the base of a cliff, look at the picture, where spring water would come forth out of the earth. So when spring came, the season, the water ran directly from that mouth in the cave into the city. And in Jesus' day, they commonly believed that their fertility gods lived in there during the winter and they returned to earth each spring. And what did they bring with them? They brought with them water so that people could live. So what they would do in the winter time, hoping that spring would come and hoping that water would come, is they would commit detestable acts of worship to their false gods right there, right there at the gates of hell. Why? They wanted to entice their gods, especially Pan, to come back and to bring the water. So what they would do is they would have a colossal sex orgy there by the gates of hell and they would also have sexual interactions with goats to be like their god why because human beings were created in god's image so human beings always want to be like their god unfortunately they just served the false god that didn't live so if our god penetrates goats with his massive erection then we should also penetrate goats with our massive erection because then he will be pleased with us and then he will bring the winter uh, uh, the spring and the water so this was a city of people eagerly knocking on the doors of hell. Hectic. Are you guys with me? So Jesus brought his disciples to this area. Absolutely shocked them because this is definitely not their vibe. And then Jesus says, this, my dear friends, this will not overpower the church. As long as it's built on the confession of what? That I am the Messiah. You guys see? Because a church that truly believes that Jesus is the Messiah will not be overpowered by everything connected to the gates of hell. It's beautiful now, isn't it? And that is why this question is so important. And that is why your answer to this question is so important. Fam, our answer to this question is the key to overpowering evil. Do you guys realize that? That is the way to defeat evil. That is the way to not be overpowered by evil. Is standing on the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. 
Jesus took them to a visible and a very visceral experience of everything that is wrong with the world. Even when I told you guys the little history story now, you must have seen your faces. Because you just knew how shocking it was. And Jesus takes them to a place where they can see how shocking the world is and how broken the world is. And then Jesus says, we will win this thing. Do you guys realize that? Jesus stands there and goes, we will win. And it starts with your confession. So, who do you say that I am? Unbelievable. Huh? Let me read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. It's a long one, but it's a good one. And it comes from his book, Mere Christianity. And he's explaining why our answer to this question is so important. Please read it with me. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Can you guys see why that would land us in serious trouble? Because the gates of Hades will not overpower the church built on the very, very uh, important confession that Jesus is God and that he is the Messiah. That is the one thing we must not say, says Lewis. A man who was merely a man and said the, thought of, uh, and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. What is your answer to that question? And if it is that Jesus is the Messiah, fam, we are going to win as long as we stand on that confession. Let me take a quick side road here. I am a co cognizant of my time, but I mean, if I don't answer the question why Jesus said to his disciples, uh, do not tell anyone about this, then most of you Bible nerds might, might go home very, very perplexed. Okay? So look at verse 30 quickly. In verse 30, it says he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. Okay, so why would Jesus command the disciples to speak to no one about him? Here's the reason. Peter's confession of Jesus as Christ carried with it the military defeat of Rome. And that's not what it was about. It was about the defeat of sin, death, and Satan. So Jesus' command actually makes perfect sense. Don't go around telling people that I'm going to defend Rome. Ach, defeat Rome. Because I'm not. My fight is something completely different. Remember, his fight started in the very first chapter when he was taken into the wilderness to have a face-off with who? The devil. And Peter expected, even though his confession was right, that Jesus would march into Jerusalem, take it over in a coup, and then from there send word to Rome and say there's a new king in town. And then Peter expected that he would live there in Burgantonius in lavish luxury with Jesus. That's what he expected. And that's not what Jesus came to do. So, Mark, Mark tells us that Jesus has been growing in his reputation. Mark tells us that he's becoming really popular. Um, Mark tells us that at times Jesus even had to take crazy measures like sit in a boat, otherwise people might squash him. So Jesus has gained a lot of popularity. And why, there was widespread belief that he was a prophet. But what would happen if his messianic identity became common knowledge? Well, then a lot of people would be saved through him, yes. But a lot of people would also uh, start building political propaganda and go, yes, 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 he's going to come and defeat Rome. And that's not what he came to do. So the fact that there's this little messianic secret in the book of Mark heightens the awesomeness, the awesomeness of Jesus. And at the same time, it gives definition to Jesus' messiahship. Do you guys see it? So that's why he said it to them. Don't go telling people stuff that's not true. That's pretty much what he said to them. All right, that was the question. Let's jump to the first death. Look at verses 31 to 33 with me. I'll take this one quickly. 
Those three words, it was necessary, is very, very important. Okay, so look at that first. It was necessary for the Son of Man, important title, and look at the three things. Suffer, rejected, and killed, and the fourth, rise after three days. And then look at what verse 32 says. He spoke openly about this. In South African vernacular, he gave it to them straight. That's actually very important. I mean, look at it. I am going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise from the dead. Whoop, there it is. Know what I mean? Straight up. And then Peter reacted the way he did, shouted at Jesus as if he was a demon, and then Jesus goes, well, let me just keep everyone in this experience. It's interesting, huh? He turns around from Peter, and then it says, looking at the disciples, he rebukes Peter back. A little fighting match. Get behind me, Satan. Do you guys remember just in Matthew now, we read, Blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah. Cursed are you, son of Jonah. Get behind me. You're acting like Satan himself. It's quite a crazy turnaround now, isn't it? In only a few verses. Jesus says, that's the game plan. And the disciples ask, Marwai. <laughs> and Jesus says, well, according to the law, blood pays for life. And someone needs to give blood, and that'll be me. Because there's life in blood. If you take someone else's life, you took their blood, so you have to give their blood back. Look at what you've all done. Look at where we are in the context of Caesarea Philippi. Someone needs to cover for this. Someone needs to atone for this. Someone needs to make at one the relationship that God has with human beings. That's going to be me. And that is exactly how I am going to do it. So, this is about more than a defeat of Rome. This is about more than human gain. Mark told us this in the beginning of the gospel. What this gospel is about and what the story is that he'll be picking up. So pretty much what Jesus asks the disciples are, where's your head at? Hey, another old song, The Basement Jacks. Do you guys remember that? The whole chorus was, where's your head at? at? Hey, do you guys remember that song? Rapper. Absolute rapper. But that's what Jesus tells his disciples. Where's your head at? He calls Peter Satan, not because Peter is Satan, but because Peter does exactly what Satan does. And that is, think only of himself. Selfish. In it for his own gain. After power. That's why Jesus says, you are acting exactly like Satan. So get behind me. Because you are the very, like this is the very thing that I'm fighting. That's what Jesus came to do. He had to die. We, we celebrated that on the table. And just in case you missed it, this means forgiveness of sins for every single human being. By grace, through faith. There we go. All of this is a gift. And God gives it, and then we grip it, and we take a leap of faith. That is how we come to faith. That's how all of us came to faith. This is the good news. There's no more cups left. But like the bread and the wine is a symbol of the good news. None of this would have been possible if Jesus didn't die. And even though the Apostle Peter rebuked him, Jesus said, there's no other way for me to do this. I have to die. Okay, and then, third point, he turns his attention and says, you also have to die. Now that's another hard one for us. Okay, so we spoke about the question. We spoke about the first death. Let's speak about the second death. Look at these highlights. Lots of verbs in here. Uh, Rudolf, can I have verse 34 onwards, please? Thank you. Look at the highlights. Follow after me. At the end of that verse, Follow me. How does that happen? Deny himself, take up his cross. Oof. 
yeah, you have to die. Because I'm going to die. And if you want to follow me, you follow me all the way through my death onto the other side. And then Jesus gives them a reason to die. Look at it. Save, lose, loses, save. But it's not a riddle. Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life, look at the, look at the highlights. Because of me and the gospel, you will save it. It's unbelievable, isn't it? And then Jesus just puts it to them. Because their heads are at human gain and power and comfort and kingship. Jesus says, what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world? and yet loses life. What a question. Do you guys realize that it's a rhetorical question? The answer is yes. Because Jesus is right. And then he hammers it home in verse 37 and says, can anyone give in exchange, what can anyone give in exchange for his life? And then, this is why we have to die. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, I will also be ashamed of him. That's hardcore, fam. We'll get back to that now. And then Jesus makes this astounding promise and says, some standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. Okay, so let's work through this quickly. This is my last point. I die, you die. I live, you live. It's as simple as that. And that's the truth. That's the gospel truth. Just like he'll win by losing, we'll save by losing. Ach, losing. Now, obviously, this was baffling for the disciples. It's baffling for us too. Because they shared a different popular expectation of what Jesus was going to do. Just a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark, we'll see people grieve when they think of the loss of family and material wealth. Later in the, uh, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 10 onwards, Shiami will be preaching on that at our baptism service. We'll see um, that the disciples start maneuvering for places of power and privilege in this new administration that they're expecting will come. The betrayal and the abandonment of Jesus when he was arrested and executed makes it abundantly clear that the disciples did not embrace Jesus' vision. Do you guys realize that? Like even though Jesus spelt it out to them, he gave it to them straight, they still left him. When he was arrested, they went, I'm out. I'm just not on for that. So how did they come back to faith? After he was risen from the grave. It was only on the third day when they heard that the tomb is empty that the disciples went, oh snap. I remember Jesus said, I die, you die. I wasn't on for that. But then Jesus said, I live, you live. He lives. This whole thing is true. We have to get back to it. Okay? We shouldn't forget that part in the, uh, in the lives of the disciples. So what Mark 27 to 33 tries to do is it, brings, it tries to bring together these two things that seem contradictory, but they're not. Think about it. On the one hand, Jesus is the Messiah. We know that. And on the other hand, his destiny is to die. And what resolves the tension is the prediction that Jesus will be resurrected. Does that make sense? I am the Messiah, I will die, but I won't be dead forever. I'll be raised from the dead and then I'll be the Messiah again. Do you guys see? Are you guys with me? Okay. That's very, very, very important. Now, Jesus knew that his followers would face ridicule. He knew that his followers would face anger as they tried to confront evil. Remember now, he stood with them at that place in Caesarea Philippi and said, we are going to win this thing. Obviously, that will be met with resistance. And Jesus' words come as a very sharp challenge to us as well. No matter how fierce the resistance is, his followers should never hide their faith in God. Or let me say it differently. We cannot successfully confront evil when we are embarrassed about our faith, fam. We just cannot. You won't die for something that you are embarrassed about, will you? And Jesus' call for us is to die. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. 
And you won't do that if you at all feel embarrassed about him. Jesus taught with passion. He kept on teaching with passion, even though some of the bystanders might have called him a fool. And then at Caesarea Philippi, did you guys see in verse 34, calling the crowd along. So there was a whole vibe between Jesus and his disciples. And then when he drops this one, he goes, let me just make sure that all of you know. Anyone? Come closer. Listen. Here's how it works. If you want to follow after me, this is how I operate. Do you guys see it? And then Jesus asks to that whole crowd, what does it benefit someone to gain the world and yet lose his life? He said that to people who had orgies and sexual interactions with goats so that Pan could come back at spring and bring them water. They were looking for life. And now Jesus says, what benefit would it be to you if you gain everything you wanted but you still lose your life? Do you see how powerful his teaching is? Because they wanted the fertility gods to bring them life. And now Jesus says, I have that life. But the life that I have comes through my death and through your death. But then I will live again and you will live again. So make your decision. It's a fascinating teaching, isn't it? Okay. So the false gods of Caesarea Philippi promised prosperity and happiness. And ultimately they can't deliver. Jesus didn't promise an easy life. But he did deliver on his promise of salvation. We know that. We just ate that this morning. And that's the only kind of life that matters to us because that's a life that lasts forever. Our whole world, fam, is filled with people who seem like they gained the world. But they lost their souls. And my question is, if we hide our faith, how will they ever hear how to save their souls? Think about that. If the message of the world is gain all you can in whatever way you can, how will people know about real life found in Jesus through the gospel, serving him as Messiah, if we never tell anyone? Look at verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Look, we are post-post-modern people. Huh? Thinkers, philosophers, ooh, technology is on our side. What do you guys say? Are we doing better than Caesarea Philippi? Absolutely not. That's the shocking thing, is the world is still as broken and shocking as it was back in the day at Caesarea Philippi. Our world can still be described as adulterous and sinful. And Jesus says, in an adulterous and sinful world, speak up. Tell people about me. Ask them who they say that I am. Be sure of your own answer. Be sure of my death. And then die away. Because then you will live away with me. We can't ignore culture. We can't ignore the world that we live in, even though it can be described as adulterous and sinful. If we could, Jesus wouldn't have taken his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Do you guys know what I mean? Like if it was the will of Jesus for us to be all locked up, only listening to elevation worship on a really low volume so that we don't disturb anyone, if that was the will of Jesus for us as Christians, then he wouldn't have taken his disciples there. He took his disciples to the dirtiest place they possibly could go by foot. There were maybe one or two more dirty places, but they couldn't have gone there by foot. So he took them to the worst place he possibly could. And then asked them who he is and said, we'll win this thing. All based and built on your confession. Are you willing to die? Are you willing to deny yourself and take up your cross? Unfortunately, fam, the glory days in Mark is over. From here onwards, every single sermon will be a hard sermon. Because that's how Mark's written. It's written, yay, whoa, yay at the end. So there is a yay at the end, okay? Come on Easter Sunday. I'll show you what the yay is. That's how the book's written. So from here onwards, it's not going to be easy. And then I want to uh, just turn your attention to 9 verse 1, and then we'll be done. 
He says, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. People were confused by that saying because they thought the kingdom of God coming in power would be what? Jesus on the throne, defeating Rome and proclaiming his rule. Jesus is talking about seeing his rule in your life. Seeing his way being manifested in your life through your relationships, through your connections with other people. Jesus is talking about Him creating something new out of the old in your own life. Jesus is talking about you being a person that embodies justice and righteousness in your relationship with Him and with other people. Jesus is talking about you living according to His rules as if He was actually the King. And that's why Jesus says in 9 verse 1, If you do what I say, you'll see my kingdom come in power. You won't taste death. It's fascinating, isn't it? So, do we long for His kingdom to come? Do we long to see His power in our lives? The way to get there is really simple. Answer His question, seize death and die yourself. Amen. Was this a heavy one for you guys? It was a heavy one for me too. Yeah. We are going to respond in song. Let me uh, offer a few possible responses for you that I think might be beneficial. Can we close our eyes and just take a moment of reflection? For some of you, today might be the very first time that you are going to say, Jesus is Lord. That's an awesome thing. If you feel led to say that, then say it and confess it because His question stands for you and your answer is a matter of life or death. Some of us might feel the urge to make a recommitment today. There's nothing wrong with that. All of us have to turn back all of us are prone to wonder and maybe today as you heard this question come to you and as you saw what Jesus said about your confession in him maybe today is the day that you just have to say Lord Jesus I have not lived as if you are the Messiah but I do believe that you are so I'm recommitting myself to you today that's one response Another response might be for you to just express your gratitude for the death of Jesus. I can actually still taste the bread and the juice in my mouth. And sometimes we make the death of Jesus cheap. And then we need to repent. And we need to say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for us. Thank you for your body and thank you for your blood. I have made it cheap and I have not followed your way but I want to express my gratitude for the fact that you died in my place. That's also a legitimate response. Some of you might just be at the place where you say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to die. I am willing to die. Some of you might be really fearful to talk about your faith and to proclaim the gospel. Maybe a good response for you is, Lord Jesus, help me to be unashamed about you. Because I want to die for you. And I don't want to be embarrassed about you. So help me to be unashamed about you. If none of those four responses resonate with you, that's also okay. Give the Holy Spirit some time to work inside of you. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I'm once again struck by how far you would go to the dirty places in this world to save people. I'm once again reminded by the fact that you came to seek and save the lost. I'm once again reminded that the bread and the cup on the table is for every single person. So Lord, thank you for saving us. And thank you for being willing to take us back if we do make a recommitment to you. 
I see the father running to the prodigal son, covering all his dirt with his robe, holding him and kissing him so that the elders of the city can't stone him. And then once again confirming him as son. May we find that grace with you this morning, Lord Jesus, as we still taste your body and your blood in our mouths. We thank you for your death. We thank you that we could celebrate that this morning. We thank you that you were faithful in going all the way and dying for us. We don't ever want to make your death cheap, Lord Jesus. We realize it wasn't a, just a slap and a cuss word. It was brutal. And all that way you thought of us. Even having grace to the point of saying, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave it all for us. Lord, I want to pray for every person this morning who wants to confess their willingness to die. This is a tough one for us, Lord Jesus. We feel like Peter more often than not. We really want to win, but we don't want to lose to win. And denying ourselves is tough. Because we believe sometimes that we are the center of the universe and that everything should revolve around us. And we know what price comes with committing to follow you all the way to the cross. We also know, Lord Jesus, that there's life to be found on the other side. So make us willing to follow you and to trust in what you say. And then, Lord Jesus, I want to pray that you would make us a courageous church full of people willing to do what needs to be done for your name and for your glory. A church that doesn't play catch up with the world, but rather a church that sets the pace of the world. A church that speaks good news, that lives good news. A church that embodies the gospel. I know, Lord Jesus, that we have many opportunities to talk about you. Give us the right words. Give us the courage. Give us the wisdom. We believe that your kingdom has to advance, Lord Jesus. And we believe that this church will not be overpowered by evil. But it will stand on our confession of you as Messiah. We praise you, Lord Jesus, as our cornerstone. We praise you as the author and the perfecter of our faith. We praise you as the Almighty One. We praise you as our Messiah. In your name we pray. Amen.